you very much. Hello, everybody. Well, my guest today has made the headlines all through her fabulous career, but recently she made headlines that none of us ever wanted to see because we read that she was hovering at death's door with meningitis. Well, this lass has made many comebacks in her time, and she's made another one, I'm delighted to say, and I'm sure you are too. Would you welcome, please, the indomitable Miss Diana Dawes. Made me feel good to be here. Love it. I'm, I'm glad to be here at all. I, <laughs> <the bet you're. laughs> I know I've come from practice from hospital, but I hasten to say this isn't my nighty. I've arrived. <laughs> <laughs> the thing well, is, these days, I mean, anything goes. I mean, I was told that this show actually sort of is is seen at different times in different places. You really don't know what to wear anymore, right. you know. Anyway, but you're looking will. nice, Derek. So that will do for both of us. <laughs> You're looking very good, Di, despite that. I feel that. very good. Thank you very much. I feel marvellous. Could we talk just a wee bit about the illness? Because well, it must have been quite, quite a shock for well, you. It was. It was, a, it was an even worse shock for my poor husband. You know, it was all right for me. I was in a coma. I didn't know what was happening. But uh, he, poor man, of course, like anybody else who's left standing at the bedside or waiting in the waiting room down the corridor, you know, had to go through all the, the agony of uh, hearing that uh, were from the doctor, which he did, that there was uh, no hope for me and so on. Actually, uh, trying to cut the story very short, I, I was feeling absolutely 100% because I'm a very healthy girl, you know, I'm a big healthy girl. <laughs> and, <laughs> and suddenly one night I just felt as though I, I had the flu and I didn't feel at all well, which is unlike me. And the next morning we called my doctor and uh, by this time the pains that I'd had in my limbs, which I thought were flu pains, uh, had gone to my head and I felt as though somebody had hit me on top of the head with an axe. I had the worst headache I've ever had. And uh, this marvellous doctor of mine, who is my local doctor, came round and, uh, as I have said before, a lesser doctor would probably have said, oh, well, you've just got a bug, because that's what they put everything down to now. This was indeed a bug, uh, and perhaps given me a shot and hope for the best, but he said, I think you may have got meningitis, and we'd better get you into hospital for tests, and thank God he did, because uh, that was the last thing I heard him say. I went into a coma, and the next thing I knew, I woke up, it was the following day, I'd had lumbar punches, I'd been at death's door, so I was told by the doctors, and they had in fact rushed me to the hospital, thanks to my doctor and his, uh, well, I suppose his efficiency, uh, apart from his know-how, and uh, killed the meningitis germ before it killed me, because it's a ghastly thing. I mean, it really is terrifying. Um, we're being a bit gloomy at the moment, but I mean, uh, don't everybody get worried every time you get a headache and think, oh, <laughs> got the same as Zion at all, you know, please don't think that. But, uh, you know, suddenly one minute you're all right, all right and you, you get this wretched thing, nobody knows how you contact it, it's the same with anything, I suppose, like a cold or flu. And uh, if it decides to take a turn, it can attack your throat or your chest, in which case I think it causes pleurisy or pneumonia or something. But if it attacks your brain, boy, you know, you've, you, you've, you've had it, unless you're very lucky as I was. Thank God I, I not only was saved, but I've also come back 100%. I mean, it can leave you in a terrible state, I'm told. It can leave you deaf or paralyzed or whatever. But here I am talking as much and driving my husband mad. <laughs> yeah, should I tell him what you said to me when you arrived today? What did I say? You said you love coming on a chat show because it gives your husband a rest. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It is infectious, this meningitis, isn't it? Oh, it is infectious, yes. Yeah, well, good night, Diana. Thank you very much. <laughs> Actually, yes, it was, I mean, it's funny now. I mean, everything's always funny after the event. You can look back on the funny side of it. You know, thank heavens my little boy didn't get it because it is a disease that is, is mostly uh, common amongst children, I'm told. Uh, it's also, uh, uh, another thing to set your minds at rest, it is uh, practically extinct, this, this thing now. Uh, trust me to try and bring back something that's extinct, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, when they knew that that was what I had, they immediately put my husband and my little boy and his nanny and the man who was decorating our hall <laughs> on, they were all on these funny pills to sort of get rid of this, you know, just in case they might have got it. But I still don't know where I caught it. They told me there had been an epidemic 
of this in Brazil, and I said, well, unfortunately, I haven't been near any Brazilians lately, so... Um, <laughs> it's the coffee, you know, it's the coffee. That yeah, I know, <laughs> right. so there we are, so that's it. But anyway, I'm here and in one piece, and thank God, thank that's God, it. As you say. Diana, let, let's go from what might have been the end of the Doors career to, to the very beginning of it. You were born in Swindon. I'm afraid so. Yes. Well, did you always want Which to... Apart to... from being born in Carlisle, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful what you say. All right, you. well, I can't offend anybody, can I? No, no, no. I was did you born always in want to, uh, to go on the stage? Always, the yeah. Right from the time I was a little girl, I, you know, it sounds terribly corny and woman's magazine-ish, this, but uh, I, I always wanted to be a film star. Uh, I was watching your interview with Larry Grayson a little while ago. He's super, isn't he? Actually, did you know I was really apricot mill? No, I didn't. <laughs> I don't think he knows it either. Really. I feel like apricot mill. From the jam. Uh, <laughs> no, he's lovely, Larry, because he's 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 a bit like me. You know, when we did, the, I did his show, and uh, of course it was one that the show ever got on because by the time the two of us had finished talking and going through all our various, he's great film goer, as he was yes, saying, yes, yes, and yes. I had always been a great film goer ever since I was a tiny child because I. I had this burning ambition to be a film star and so on. That was nothing to do with being an actress as far as I was concerned in those. I was just a little girl and a film star was all I wanted to be. Now I know it requires a great deal more than that, you know, and acting does rather come into it. But uh, <laughs> uh, I was fortunate. I had good parents. They, they were indulgent. Well, my mother was. Anyway, my father didn't think it was a good idea at all. But anyway, he paid for me to go to London and uh, study at the uh, London Academy of Dramatic Art because I think he thought I was going to go back to Swindon and become an elocution teacher. Can you imagine? <laughs> anyway, that was his dream and it didn't work out and I went on. I was very, very lucky. You see, my career shot forward. I've always been a very lucky person, you know. I have, I have incredible bad luck. I mean, things happened to me. I mean, last year, well, the year before now, I broke my leg and the year before that my husband broke his back I mean we always managed to do something he or I before the years over but uh, I, in spite of this bad luck we have the this incredible good luck and I suppose a marvelous resilience that we can overcome and, and ride the storm and uh, in my early career when I was 14 and 15 which is a hundred years ago <laughs> uh, I was, uh, whilst I was still at the uh, Dramatic Art Academy, I was uh, tested, I was screen tested for a part in a film called The Shop at Sly Corner, and I got the part, I lied about my age, I pretended I was 17, because I don't think I'm only 14, there's no way I'll get it, because it was part of a tart, as usual, that's all I ever did play. <laughs> I'm still playing, I'm only the very old ones now. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time I was 15, I was under contract with the J. Arthur Rank organization. Of course, in those days, the Rank organization was booming, and uh, he was handing out contracts like jelly beans. And uh, I, well, I just did so many films. I mean, I see them all now on television. Wince, you know, I look at myself and think, however, did I get any work after that? I mean, some of the performances I gave, and it's strange, you know, when you look back on yourself when you're very young, uh, apart from looking much younger, but your voice changes as well, even a girl's voice. I mean, you may think a man's voice changes, but when you're much younger, uh, your voice is rather up there, and my voice used to be very squeaky, you know, it's much deeper. Perhaps I'm changing my sex. <laughs> Well, it's marvellous because, I mean, look where it's been. <laughs> well, Danny LaRue doesn't do too badly, does he? <laughs> so that's more or less the story. I mean, I, I, uh, but you I also think got you know that you in... must have read about sure. everything that's happened yeah. to me. I mean, as any avid reader of the news of the world will tell you, I mean... Uh, <laughs> but what about the sort of variety very... side? You did a stage oh, cabaret I, act. I've done everything you. except circus, Derek. <laughs> And there's plenty of time for that. How did that come about then? The, the, the variety the, scene. Yeah. Well, many, many years ago, I was in uh, my first uh, stage show because I went the other way. Usually, people go, uh, they, they become actresses or actors via the theatre and then they progress to films and, of course, now to television. I, of course, did it all the other way around. I've always been different and I, I, I was in films and I made many, many films. Uh, by the time I was 17, I, I'd even got my first starring role in a film, only because the leading lady turned it down. And Miss Diana Dawes. Diana, where have we got to? And Mr. Let's, let's Derek Beatty. Thank you very much. You are lovely, let's, you know. Oh, that's very kind. You are one of the loveliest interviewers there is on TV.
I'm supposed to do that all the, all the I talking. know. Well, I'm saying in front of everybody, I should get into trouble with your wife, but I don't care. Dana, let's 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 go to Hollywood for a few Shall minutes. Shall we? Yes. All right. When did you I'd first go? I'd rather be in Carlisle than Hollywood. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth. When did you first go to Hollywood? I went there in 1956. Uh, it's a fabulous place. Don't get me wrong. I mean, America is a fabulous country, and especially the first time you ever go there, it's so exciting and. I had always, naturally, as I told you earlier on, I wanted to be a film star when I was a little girl, and of course, naturally, the mecca is Hollywood, or at least it was Hollywood. I mean, it isn't so much today, because films are not what they were. I mean, television is really the big thing. But uh, to go there for the first time when I was, what, 23, 24, uh, the way I went, I mean, it was just absolutely super. And I used to think to myself when I was lying there in the sun by the side of my swimming pool and everything, oh, this is it, you know, I've arrived and, and what else is there? I mean, this is, this is the culmination of all my ambitions. And why does everybody knock Hollywood? I mean, it could only be failures that knock Hollywood because, I mean, it's a land of milk and honey and it was beautiful. But I gradually began to find out what it is. I, I can't explain, uh, especially to, to anyone who hasn't been there, there is something about the place. It's a lovely place to visit. It's a lovely place to work because they're very professional uh, and efficient. And I, I, love to, I love visiting and I love working. In fact, my two oldest sons by my former marriage live there now. And I don't see very much of them, I'm very sorry to say. And of course, they are totally American and very old for their one's 15 and the other's 12. And they're both going on 50 in their minds. You know, I mean, really, they... But this is American children. But it, there's something about America. I don't know whether it's it perhaps it's just Hollywood. But when you've been there a while, you suddenly, I know it sounds crazy, but you suddenly start thinking, this isn't quite real. Hollywood is rather like a film set. The banks, the post offices, the shops, they're, it's almost like a gigantic film set that you feel someone's going to pull down tomorrow. Nothing seems permanent. Uh, the people are not real. They're not like the English people in as much as I've always said about the Americans, we speak the same language, but that is literally where it finishes. Their sense of humor is different from ours. Their way of living is different. Um, I find that American women particularly are very spoiled. They can't help it. I mean, we'd all like to be spoiled, let's face it, but you know, when people do get spoiled, they become disenchanted. And I think this is one of the things that I am a little upset about as far as my sons are concerned, because you see, they have everything, everything, every kind of luxury. I'm not, not just talking about my sons, I'm talking about American women. Uh, every kind of labor saving device, every kind of luxury, everything, it's, it's a woman's world. Now you may think, wonderful, I, I'd love to go there and I'd like to live there, but when you have everything all the time, it's like Christmas every day. Suddenly, nothing becomes exciting anymore. You lose total uh, enchantment with life. Um, and I find American women are very much uh, of the attitude, so show me something I haven't seen before. And this awful boredom sets in and, and nothing, nothing is a thrill. And I think when a thrill goes out of life, you know, what, what is there? It's terrible. I mean, my sons are like this. They've had everything there is to have. And I worry about them because I think, well, when they get to 25 and 30, what's going to be left for them that they haven't seen and done and had, you know? And this is, this is one of the reasons that I like living here in England. I mean, <laughs> we all know it's gloomy at the moment. Uh, and we all know it really is reality over here. And people say to me, oh, you must be mad to live over here weather and the tax and everything else but I'll tell you something you know this really isn't a bad old country to live in for all its faults and I know it sounds crazy but when you live in total permanent sunshine all the time as say California is you long for seasons you long for the spring you long for a shower of English rain or I find the men long to go into a little country pub or something I know they're simple things but it really you know basically human beings are simple <laughs> creatures and we really do like the simple things after we've had all the luxuries like eating a great box of chocolates after you've eaten it or you think oh I wish I hadn't had all that it's too much you know <laughs> and let's face it you can only drive one car at a time and sleep in one bed and live in one house no matter how gorgeous it is you know yes, yes. I think I've covered Hollywood I think so <laughs>
Yes, I love the bit about Probably sleeping. haven't convinced you. You love like the, the bit, bit about, about sleeping, sleeping in one bed, bed at a time. Well, probably, well, let's go into that, Doc. It probably doesn't apply to you. I want to talk to you about films you've made here, and particularly the one I think that everyone really thought was your best film, The Condemned. Oh, film, Yield, the to, Yield the to the Night. Night. Mm. Yes offered to me when they made it into a film and he said uh, and they want you to play one of the two old hags outside Newgate <laughs>